Welcome again to Secret of the Golden Flower. Why is it such a secret? Huh? It seems obvious to me. <laughs> One time, Sariputta came to visit Buddha. And he sat down and he was saying, you know, this dependent origination is very deep. But to me, it's just as clear and obvious as the sunlight. And Buddha said, don't say that. <laughs> don't say that. Sorry, Buddha. This is very deep. It's really hard for people to understand. Almost everybody gets it wrong. So it may be obvious to you, but for most people, it's opaque. And this is our experience too, <laughs> over the last few days. I asked for feedback, right? Okay, so I got a bunch of feedback. And what that shows me is that <sighs> it's very hard to get this idea across. And I'm sure I'm not the first one <laughs> to notice this, uh, Buddha, mentioned it 2,500, 600 years ago, and we're finding the same today. So either people are not watching the previous videos, or they're misunderstanding the terms, not looking them up, or they're not going back to the original source documents, the suttas, and studying them, or they're not meditating and contemplating on this teaching, they're trying to understand it mentally, verbally. That's also not going to work. So I'm just going to keep going here. <laughs> Try to clear up some of the misunderstandings that I'm aware of, thanks to your feedback. Keep it up. It's really valuable to me. Because to me, I mean... I've been studying dependent origination now for four years, a little more than four years. And to me, it's quite clear, very clear. Uh, and uh, the proof of it is I was able to get fourth path realization. I was able to duplicate and experience all eight jhanas. So, uh, you know, that's pretty much uh, the test. So I want to go ahead and address some specific concerns here. Let's take a look at dependent origination again. So we went over yesterday, last time, how dependent origination, the process of becoming, starts from ignorance, the threefold ignorance. And it moves down through these 12 stages all the way to suffering, dukkha. So, usually what happens at the end of life, when a person is confronted with the inevitability of their death, is that they again begin the same cycle over again. In other words, they go from suffering straight back to ignorance and take another round. This is samsara. This is the cycle of birth and death. Usually people never get to the green side of the circle. They stay stuck on the red side and experience birth, death, suffering again and again and again without release. Maybe they go up to the heavenly planets sometimes. Maybe they go down to the hellish planets sometimes. Maybe they become an animal. Then again, a human. Who knows? It's because of the karma that they have created and because they insist on creating a self that karma has some address 
And so it comes back to them and they have to experience the results of their activities all over again. So that's one misunderstanding that a person does not get to even conviction uh, without a special study, without special training, and certainly without a certain practice based on the training. So uh, what is all that? Well, the Buddha's teaching begins from, really, the understanding of dependent origination. If you can understand that simply by manipulation of name and form, you can change your consciousness and you can change the results of the whole process. If you don't get that far, you will not get to the first green stage called conviction. What is conviction? Sometimes it's mistranslated faith. But faith is trust in a promise made by someone else. Try to understand. Faith is looking forward to a future, a certain future that has been promised by someone, usually in a, a spiritual authority of some kind. But that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about conviction. Conviction is the certainty that this process works. Now, how are you going to get that certainty? By practicing it. And I want to make also very, very clear that when we talk about Buddha's teaching, we are not talking about Buddhism. Now, you can take Buddha's teaching and you could really establish an arbitrary number of different philosophies or religions based on it. And then people have for thousands of years now. The secret goal of the golden flower is one of those. Some are authentic in that they work. Some are inauthentic in that they don't work. They don't deliver the promise. And now remember, the, the promise of the Buddha's teaching is Nibbana. But that's very far away from most people, from almost everyone, very far. So what is there that one could practice that would give a result quickly enough to convince you? Uh, that's what conviction is. When you become convinced, uh, and not a faith, but a conviction from personal experience that the process works. And the same is true of bhakti. There are a few source literatures on bhakti that speak of bhakti in general. Most of the literature, most of the material on bhakti is about a specific flavor of bhakti. And almost all of those are about what's called vaidhi bhakti or Bhakti based on rules and regulations. Now, what's the difference between Vaidhi Bhakti and authentic Bhakti? Well, it's like the difference between marriage and love. In marriage, you have a bunch of rules and regulations. It's a social contract. It's a commitment. It looks toward the future. And it says, we're going to love each other forever. <laughs> it can't happen by the nature of humanity and by the nature of love itself it can't happen and the failure of love to deliver the promise of forever is one of the great uh, landmarks in the development of human consciousness Depending on how you take it, you could either give on, up on love forever or you can move beyond this crippled kind of love based on a social contract, based on a, an impossible promise. Huh? I promise I'm going to love you forever. 
Well, good luck with that. Because we get bored. We get used to a certain thing, and then it doesn't please anymore the way it did. And then we want to give it up and move on to something else, isn't it? But real love is never boring. You see? Real love, though, has no rules, no promises, no forever. It's only happening now. While it happens now, it's beautiful. And when it's over, then it's time to move on. So real bhakti is completely free. There are no rules, no regulative principles. That was a concoction. Huh? Especially when Prabhupada packaged uh, Bengali bhakti to bring to the West, he put it in the framework of a Protestant religion, of a Puritanist religion. Huh? All these rules and regulations that nobody can follow. Come on, admit it. So if you try, you will fail again and again. And that gives you the feeling that I am no good. I can't make it. So you start being down on yourself. And if you don't love yourself, how can you love anybody else? Another thing that he did was he made the only object of this bhakti to be Lord Krishna. And I mean, if you really look into the uh, research that's been done on this question, it's very doubtful whether Lord Krishna, as he's described in the scriptures, ever existed. He became a very convenient symbol for a particular point of view, political, social, and religious point of view, a particular morality. And as you know, religion and morality are used by politicians to subjugate the people, make them submissive, and conquer them. Divide and conquer. So bhakti became a political tool in the last three, four hundred years in India. And it has been used in the, uh, again, uh, artificial creation of what's now called Hinduism. Uh, which is very funny because we don't ever find this word Hindu in the Vedic scriptures anywhere. So all these things, these concoctions, these um, fabrications have been made. And in the Buddhist uh, society, the same thing has happened. There is now a Protestant religion called Buddhism uh, in the East and in the West. And the Zen, for example, that was shipped out of Japan to California <laughs> in the 1960s was created only a few years before in a think tank. And of course, uh, Suzuki, one of the, uh, if not the main teacher of Zen in the 60s, was a member of that think tank. He had no real spiritual background. He was an intellectual, a politician. So what we know of these traditions has been extensively fabricated into politically convenient themes and packaged in uh, a way that would be palatable to Western people, which now is almost everybody because Western culture has penetrated almost the whole world. So we don't know, unless we go back to the original source literatures, we don't know that there's a level of spiritual practice that is beyond all rules. And that is the authentic level. Buddha never gave all these rules. Those were added later by the scholars and religionists. Huh? You won't find anywhere in the Vedic scriptures all these rules. You only find them in the recent ones that were written maybe a thousand years ago or even less in the religious phase. So, okay, there's the, what's called 
in some circles, the neophyte phase, uh, where you have to follow all these rules and regulations. And then there's the advanced phase. Of course, the gurus are supposed to be in the advanced phase. But, you know, before Prabhupada, no bhakti guru ever talked about rules and regulations. That was his concoction. That was his fabrication. And before the Buddhist uh, revival in Sri Lanka in the early 19-teens, um, with uh, the carnival shows and, and healing circuses. And I mean, it was just like a Wild West revival going around Sri Lanka uh, with Colonel Olcott, who was never actually a colonel, becoming a, a national hero. And yet his mission was not to help Buddhism but to make it into a, a religion that could be then separated from the civil life of the country for colonial purposes. So the actual spiritual practices, the actual teachings have become covered over with all these interpretations based on fabrications. So because of this, people never get the actual conviction the actual experience that these things were. Let me give you some personal examples. When I retired in 19, sorry, in 2001, I went to Hawaii. I camped out in the woods in a beautiful place near the ocean. And I did uh, japa, mantra yoga, for a minimum of eight hours a day for six months. 64 rounds. Now, I don't know any high-ranking uh, leader in the Hare Krishna movement who ever did that. They are usually so busy with preaching and administration and politics that their sadhana was minimal or even non-existent. That's the truth. And the same goes for Buddhism. When I was in the uh, monasteries in Sri Lanka, the sadhana that the monks were doing was just perfunctory. It was just show bottle. It was just a few minutes in the morning, maybe 25 to 30 minutes of meditation in the morning. That was it. I went off alone in my cabin and I was meditating like 8, 10, 12 hours a day for months. None of those guys ever did that. None of them got path realizations either. So, if you really want to attain certainty, conviction, experienced knowledge of these paths, you have to practice them intensively. Intensively enough to actually change your mind. And once you get the result of these practices, then you don't have to believe anymore. You don't have to rely on faith. You don't have to rely on some promise. You'll know. And what will you know? That these processes, these practices give deep satisfaction, contentment. If you actually learn this Paticca Samuppada, this dependent origination process, and start to use the name and form to change your consciousness, then you'll very quickly get everything that you want in life. It's not something I can explain in just a few words. It's like you create the karma to make your life wonderful and sublime. And after that, then you say, okay, this thing works. Now I'm going to do the whole practice. So that's what we did. And now we're very happy with the result, extremely satisfied with the result. You can too. Don't remain in doubt. Rather, arrange your life in such a way that you can practice these things, these authentic spiritual methods, and get the result for yourself. And then you can have this same experience. So now I'm almost out of time already. Man, it goes so fast. But if I make these longer, nobody is going to watch them all the way through. They don't anyway. 
The average view is like seven or eight minutes. It's sad. I don't know how anybody could get the benefit just by watching a few minutes. It's not enough. These ideas are too big. They won't fit in just a few minutes, a few words. It needs a detailed explanation. So the next time I'm going to explain the green side of dependent origination and what this is, just to, to finish up here, it is another process of becoming using the same principles. However, instead of being based on ignorance, it's based on experience, conviction, and certainty.